We live in a world where you can meet someone and think that they're the kindest, most caring, and compassionate person ever. Whether it's because they look unassuming, maybe they have a gentle smile that draws you in, maybe they just have one of those personalities that feels warm and welcoming from the jump. But no matter how well you may think you know someone, everyone has their secrets they keep from the rest of the world, and sometimes those secrets are truly disturbing. Behind that smiling face and kind eyes can be a monster lurking, and you'd never know until their true self is revealed in the most tragic, shocking way. That is what happened in this case, and when you hear the details of what happened to this sweet, innocent little boy, you will question whether you truly know anyone as well as you think you do. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we're going to be discussing the horrific case of Kyle Lazarick. Kyle Lazarick and his twin brother, Ryan, were born on August 10th, 2004 to parents Renee and Mike Lazarick, and they had an older sister named Alyssa, who was just over a year older than the twin boys. At the time, the family were living in a home in McKinney, Texas. Of course, having one child is a handful all on its own, but now Renee and Mike had their one-year-old plus two newborn babies. Before Ryan and Kyle were born, Renee and Mike took special classes at the hospital to ensure they had the information they needed to properly care for these two needy babies. Renee wanted to make sure she did her due diligence as a mother, and by all accounts, she did just that. Renee and Mike were known to be very attentive, loving, caring parents to their three young children. However, as the boys got a bit older, Renee needed to go back to work. Starting a few weeks before her maternity leave was over, the family started looking around for a nanny. Now, before the boys were born, Alyssa went to daycare, which she loved. She thrived in that daycare, she made a bunch of friends, and was very happy there. But again, Renee was constantly worried about her twins, knowing that they needed special care. They each had a medication schedule, and there's just a lot more to keep in mind when you're caring for two young babies at the same time. So, Renee and Mike decided that they would hire a nanny to watch the twins while Alyssa continued going to daycare. Over the course of a few weeks, the family interviewed several candidates. Eventually, they interviewed then 27-year-old Ada Cuadros Fernandez. When Renee and Mike met Ada, they immediately liked her. She had a sweet, kind personality, a good sense of humor, and seemed to be a good person overall. Ada had recently moved to the United States from Peru, where her parents still lived at the time. It seemed like she came from a good family, too. Her mother, back in Peru, worked as a veterinarian, and her father as a pediatrician. Ada seemed to be hardworking, responsible, and caring. She seemed to be the perfect nanny for baby Kyle and Ryan. At first, Renee and Mike were hoping for a nanny that could come to the home daily, but they ultimately agreed to allow Ada to be a live-in nanny if she was hired. By November of 2004, the family offered Ada the job, requesting that she commit to being with them for at least 18 months. Ada easily agreed to this, saying that she hoped to be with them for at least five years. In terms of payment, the Lazarics and Ada agreed on a certain amount, and they paid her in full each week with the expectation that Ada would report her own income and get her own taxes paid. After being hired on, Renee spent the following two weeks with Ada, watching her perform her duties and making sure she was doing everything expected of her. Renee made sure to give Ada all the information they learned in those hospital classes, telling her everything she needed to know about caring for infant twins. She explained all of their special needs, their required medications, and feeding times. Renee requested that Ada keep a detailed log of everything the boys did each day to make sure she was aware of what was going on while she was at work. Renee admitted that leaving her twins with a nanny was hard. She constantly worried about their safety. She really wanted to make sure that whoever was caring for her precious twins would do just as good of a job as she would. She didn't want either of them to accidentally get a double medication dose. She didn't want either of them to go hungry or go without individual attention and care. But after that initial two weeks, and as time went on with Ada caring for the boys, Renee's worries started to melt away. Now, Ada lived with the family during the week and then would stay with her aunt and uncle on the weekends. She had her own bedroom and bathroom in the house and ate meals with the family. 
Over the course of the following months, the family grew close with Ada and started seeing her as a part of the family. Renee was happy with the care she provided and felt that her boys had a special bond with her. Even though Alyssa was still going to daycare, she still loved Ada. She was such a good person to have around. However, by Thursday, September 29th, 2005, less than a year after Ada started working for the family, she informed Renee and Mike that her aunt and uncle were moving back to Peru, then moving again to Germany, and she was going with them. At that time, she still had a lot of family affairs to get in order before she moved, so she said she would still live with them until the end of October. But after that, she was leaving. This news really surprised Renee and Mike, especially because Ada had already agreed to work for them for 18 months at minimum. She had never previously led on that she ever intended on working for them any less time than that, again, saying that she wanted to be with them for at least five years. This situation also brought up the issue of whether Ada was going to properly file her taxes. Again, they hadn't been withholding taxes the entire time Ada worked for them. Ada was going to report her own income. But with this move happening right before tax season, Renee and Mike were concerned that she wasn't going to get them filed. After hearing this news, the Lazarix told Ada that they were going to be delaying her next payment for a few days. Typically, they paid her every Friday, but they wanted to use that weekend to figure out what, if any, tax liability they had if Ada didn't pay her income taxes. They assured her that she would be paid that Monday after they got everything sorted out. By the following day, Friday, September 30th, Mike returned home from work early, only to find that Ada completely cleaned out her room. At that time, she let Mike know that she was quitting. Mike tried talking to her about it, but Ada said that she wasn't going to talk about it until Renee returned home. Once Renee was home and spoke with Ada, she said that she thought Renee was going to stop paying her even though she agreed to stay through October. But Renee assured her that this was not the case. There must have been a misunderstanding because she was still going to pay her. It was just going to be delayed a few days. She wasn't being punished or anything. She really just needed to figure out the tax issue and would be paying her in a few days. At the time, Ada agreed to stay until the end of October, but she did still move out of the house. Now, she was living with her aunt and uncle full time. Now, after hearing that Ada was moving, Renee started looking into other candidates to hire on as a nanny. By October 12th, she received an unexpected call from one of the potential candidates and agreed to interview them that same evening. After setting up the interview, Renee reached out to Ada, asking if she could spend the night that night so she could watch the kids while she did the interview. Ada agreed and went to the home for the night. That night, Renee asked Ada to make some mac and cheese for the kids, saying that Mike would be picking up some food for the three adults on his way home from work. Ada agreed, and the evening went on as planned. By the time both Renee and Mike got home, everything seemed totally fine and normal. Both Kyle and Ryan were their happy, goofy selves. Neither of them were fussy, and Ada hadn't mentioned anything significant happening that day. Renee and Mike grabbed the boys and rocked them while casually chatting with Ada. After that, they put the boys in their cribs and the family and Ada all went to bed. By the morning of October 13th, 2005, Renee woke up with a massive migraine headache. Kyle had woken up crying at 5 a.m. that morning, so Renee pulled herself out of bed to go take care of him. She picked him up and quickly rocked him back to sleep. After he fell asleep, Mike took over so that Renee could go back to bed and sleep for a while longer. That morning, at around 7.30 a.m., Mike made some pancakes for the kids before he and Ada got Kyle and Ryan dressed. After that, by around 8.30 a.m., Mike left for work, kissing his kids goodbye for the day. By 9.20 a.m., Renee got up for the day. She first went and checked on the kids who were in the playroom, happily playing with their blocks. She got ready for work before going and kissing her babies goodbye. There was no way that Renee and Mike could have possibly known that this would be the very last time they would kiss 14-month-old Kyle goodbye. By around 12.50 p.m. that day, Ada called Renee to let her know that Kyle was struggling to breathe and that she had already called 911. 
Ada said that she was feeding the boys spaghetti, and once they were done, she put them in their playroom one at a time. She first took Kyle and then went to go get Ryan. But by the time she returned to the playroom with Ryan, she noticed that Kyle was throwing up. She immediately ran to grab a bowl to catch the vomit, but when she returned again, she saw that Kyle had fallen over. She then picked Kyle up and took him to the sink where she tried to stop him from choking. Renee had previously shown Ada what to do in a case of choking, but whatever Renee showed her was not working at that time. When Ada called 911, she told the operator a similar story. She said that Kyle was choking, throwing up, and stopped breathing. By then, he was starting to turn purple. The operator explained to Ada how to clear his airway and perform CPR, which she did until paramedics arrived. As Ada was on the phone with 911, Renee had also called to make sure that they had the correct address and to make sure they knew just how dire the situation was. Pretty quickly, first responders arrived to the home and took Kyle to the nearest hospital for treatment. Immediately after getting the call from Ada, both Renee and Mike left work. Renee rushed home to pick up Ada and Ryan while Mike went straight to the hospital to meet the rest of the family. But by the time they got to that hospital, they were told that Kyle was being airlifted to Dallas Children's Hospital. By that point, Mike, Renee, Ryan, and Ada all went back to the home. Mike and Renee got ready to head to Dallas, asking Ada to stay at home and watch Ryan while they were gone. Of course, it seemed that they didn't want little Ryan to go through all of the stress of going to the hospital and having to wait there. Instead, he could stay with their trusted nanny who is perfectly capable of caring for him. However, after they left, Renee started to get worried that Ada was too upset to properly care for Ryan. After all, she had become like family to them, so she was probably just as worried as they were about Kyle's well-being. So, Renee called a friend, Janet, asking her to meet Ada at the house to help care for Ryan, which she did. But then, by the time Renee and Mike reached the Dallas Children's Hospital, they were informed that Kyle's condition was much, much worse than Ada let on. After examining Kyle, doctors found that Kyle had extensive bruising to the right and left sides of his head, as well as two small areas of petechia on his right temple. There was bruising on his left shoulder as well as on both his lower arms. Additionally, he had suffered a subdural hematoma, aka a brain bleed, as well as cerebral edema or brain swelling. Then he suffered retinal hemorrhaging and retinal folding in his eyes. Based on the bruising found on his head, the doctor determined that Kyle sustained three separate blows to his head. The brain swelling and bleeding, along with the damage to his retina, all indicated that he suffered a very, very severe head injury, which only could have been caused from multiple significant impacts to his head. After this examination, doctors performed an operation to help decrease the pressure in Kyle's skull before placing him on life support he was not expected to survive. At that time, a doctor who specializes in child abuse met with Renee and Mike and told them that the injuries Kyle sustained were not from a simple fall, as Ada tried to make it seem. The extent of his head injury could not have happened just from Kyle sitting upright and tipping over. He believed that Kyle had been abused. When the doctor was delivering this news, Renee couldn't believe it. She wholeheartedly trusted Ada, and even though there was this minor misunderstanding with the payment thing, that had already been resolved. She initially thought that maybe Ada had been carrying Kyle and somehow fell, or maybe she accidentally dropped him, but was too nervous to tell them. But doctors told them that the severity of injury Kyle sustained just was not consistent with any sort of accident. There had to be a certain level of force applied to cause these injuries. Kyle had been physically abused. There was no way around it. As all of that was happening, as doctors were performing these tests, examining Kyle and delivering this news, Janet was heading over to the home where Ada was caring for Ryan. By this point, Janet had no idea of the injuries Kyle sustained, and again, Mike and Renee were in the process of finding everything out, so they hadn't gotten a chance to contact anybody. By the time Janet got to the home, Ada was absolutely hysterical and crying. 
Gianna asked Ada what happened, and at that time, Ada gave a slightly different story. This time, she told Janet that Kyle was standing up between the playroom and the kitchen when he suddenly collapsed. She said that she tried CPR, but she said that Kyle's brain wasn't fully developed from the time that he was born, so he had some sort of brain issue his entire life. I don't know if that's true or why that's relevant at the time, but that's what she said. As she was explaining the situation to Janet, she was switching between being calm and matter-of-fact to bursting out and crying. Ada assured Janet that she loved Kyle and would never do anything to hurt him on purpose. Janet assured Ada that she was a good person and she knew that. She knew that she would never purposely hurt that baby. For a while after this, Ada calmed down. Her and Janet sat together, waiting to hear from Renee and Mike about Kyle's condition. But then, Ada noticed a cop car pull up to the house. Even though paramedics had already taken Kyle to the hospital, officers still wanted to speak with Ada since she was the one who placed that 911 call and she was the one who was with Kyle when he stopped breathing. Once cops showed up to that door, according to Janet, Ada became hysterical again. At that point, officers tried calming Ada down, telling her that they just wanted to talk to her about what happened. At that time, Ada gave police the same story that she had been saying. She fed the boys. She put Kyle down. He threw up. So she went to grab a bowl to catch the puke to prevent a stain from getting on the floor. But suddenly, Kyle fell over, turned blue, and started convulsing. She called 911 and tried CPR until help arrived. However, by that point, Officers had actually just called the hospital to follow up and inquire about Kyle's condition, and they were told of how severe Kyle's head injuries were, and they knew for certain that they were not caused by an accident. So, after hearing Ada's original story, officers told Ada that her story did not explain how Kyle would have injured his head. Of course, Ada changed her story slightly at that time, saying that he might have hit his head when he fell over in the playroom. But that didn't make sense either. The playroom floor was soft and covered in mats. There were no tables or chairs with sharp edges for him to hit his head on. So even if he did fall over, even if he had somehow stood up on his own and completely just tipped over and slammed his head on the floor, that would not have caused the injuries that he had because the floor was very soft. Knowing this, Ada changed her story again. She told officers that she may have bumped Kyle's head on the door jam while carrying him on her hip. She said that Renee and Mike bump Kyle's head all the time and nothing has ever happened, so she didn't think that him bumping his head on the door jam had anything to do with him falling over and convulsing. She didn't think that he sustained any sort of brain injury or anything like that. But once again, Officer said that his injuries couldn't have been caused by a simple bump. So now, Ada said that she was actually running with him when Kyle bumped his head on the door jam. The officer went to go look at the door jam in question, but saw no indication of any damage. Again, the amount of force required to cause Kyle's injuries would have caused some damage to that door jam. So once again, officers told Ada that her story was not adding up. By this point, Ada didn't really have anything else to say. She denied hitting or shaking Kyle, saying that she would never purposely hurt him. At the time, officers did arrest Ada for causing injury to a child while they continued their investigation, because at this point, they knew that something was going on. They knew that Ada had to have caused his injuries, but they weren't exactly sure how. After arresting Ada, officers took her into the station for another interview. Once again, they told her that all of these stories she was telling were not consistent with Kyle's injuries. At that time, Ada changed her story yet again. Now she said that on the morning of October 12th, Kyle was sitting on the cabinet when he reached up onto the counter for something and fell off. He hit his head on the floor, so Ada put an ice pack on his head for 30 to 40 minutes. When Renee got home from work that day, she didn't mention the fall because Renee had a headache and she didn't want to make her feel worse. She said that Kyle seemed fine at the time, so she didn't think it was a big deal to delay telling Renee. When asked why she didn't tell officers about the fall initially, she said that she didn't think they would believe her story. 
this was now the story she was sticking with. In the meantime, Renee and Mike held their breath as the hospital staff did everything they could to save Kyle's life. But by the morning of Friday, October 14th, doctors informed them that Kyle was now brain dead. There was absolutely no chance of him coming back. It was at that time when Renee and Mike made the impossible decision to remove Kyle from life support. After Kyle died, his body was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. There, the Emmy basically confirmed everything we already discussed, that Kyle had suffered severe traumatic injuries to his brain that could not have been caused by accident. These injuries were not caused by hitting his head against a door jam one time. They couldn't be caused even by falling off from a high surface like a counter. A fall off the counter may cause some bruising and brain tissue damage, but it would not have caused the retinal hemorrhaging or the petechial injuries. His head had been slammed against a hard surface multiple times. That is what the autopsy was showing. Now, I want to note that as we heard a minute ago, Ada said that Kyle fell and hit his head on October 13th. After this fall, he was seen playing by both of his parents that evening. Again, he was acting completely normally. He was happy, not fussy at all. He had no obvious bruises or any other injuries on his head or anywhere on his body. That being said, knowing the extent of his injuries, doctors knew that there was no way that Kyle would have been able to sit up and play normally had he sustained his injuries on October 13th. If he got those injuries from a fall that happened that day, Renee and Mike would have seen very notable changes in his behaviors. He would have been unresponsive, comatose, not alert and happy. Therefore, those injuries had to have happened on October 14th after Mike and Renee left for work. So again, there was no question whatsoever that Kyle sustained these injuries while under Ada's care. Hello, Editing Rachel here. I just noticed that I mixed up the dates here and I think I mixed them up for the remainder of the video. So I wanted to come on here and correct myself. So the day that Ada watched Kyle was actually on October 12th. And that was the night that Renee and Mike came home, saw that Kyle was perfectly fine and they all went to bed. That was the night that Renee did that interview with the other nanny. It was on the 13th when Renee and Mike left for work, leaving the boys under Ada's care. And that is when they got the 911 call and that is when Kyle went to the hospital. So just so you know, for the remainder of the video, if I do mix up the dates again, it was the 12th that Ada is claiming he fell, but we know that he didn't. It had to have been on the 13th. From there, detectives continued their investigation into what really caused Kyle's death. What exactly did Ada do to this poor baby to cause such extensive injuries? They first searched the home for evidence, which they completed by October 14th. That same day, investigators asked friends and family to go over to the home to help clean up before Renee and Mike got home from the hospital, just to make this transition easier and to just take some of the burden off of them in any small way they could. Well, when Renee's sister showed up and started cleaning around the kitchen, she noticed a piece of tape sticking out from under a cabinet door located beneath the counter on the kitchen's island. She opened this door only to find that the door had been broken and put back together with masking tape. This was a door that Renee and her sister both would frequently open and she never noticed any damage before. Then Mike would later say that he used that cabinet on the morning of October 13th and didn't notice any damage. It certainly wasn't all taped up. Renee's sister called detectives and informed them of what she found, so a forensics team went to the house to collect that cabinet door for testing. As I stated, Kyle had suffered from small petechial abrasions to the right side of his temple. Well, investigators measured the metal fasteners on the door and determined that they were the exact same length apart as those abrasions on Kyle's temple. Then forensic analysts swabbed that cabinet door and the masking tape and tested it for DNA. They found DNA that was consistent with Ada's DNA all over that masking tape. Then they found a very small amount of Kyle's DNA and a small crack along the inside of one of the indentations on that door. 
On the outside of that door, they also found trace amounts of Renee and Mike's DNA, which of course would make sense because they would have frequently touched that door. Now, based on the DNA they did find on that door, again, Kyle's DNA was only found in a crack on one of the indentations on that door. It seems like it must have been wiped down and cleaned before it was taped together because the majority of the DNA they found was on that masking tape. Now, based on everything that we've discussed up to this point, including the fact that that Kyle must have been injured while Ada was the only adult home, knowing that his injuries couldn't have been accidental. Then seeing how some of his injuries lined up with the metal on that cabinet door and then just the cabinet door being smashed up to begin with. It was clear to officers that Kyle's head had been slammed against that cabinet door at least three times. And it was clear that Ada was the one who did it. By this point, Ada Cuadros Fernandez was charged with the capital murder of a child under the age of 10. She pleaded not guilty, and her case went to trial the following year. At her trial, the prosecution outlined everything that I've told you up to this point. How the evidence lines up with Ada smashing that baby's head against the cabinet multiple times, killing him. They even said that the extent of Kyle's injuries were consistent with a fall from a six-story building. That is how much force she used. The timeline of events only makes sense for Ada to have been the only adult home when the injuries were sustained. Then the cabinet markings line up with the markings on Kyle's head. In addition to that evidence, it was clear from the beginning that Ada was lying. She changed her story multiple times. If it truly was an accident, why did she lie? Why did she keep making up different stories? It did not make any sense. On the other hand, the defense continued to argue that this was an accident. The story she went with that trial was that he fell and hit his head on the cabinet door. After hitting his head, he started vomiting and just stopped breathing. But it was all a horrible, tragic accident. The only thing missing from the trial and the whole case in general was a motive. As I stated before, Ada had been great with Kyle and Ryan since she started working for the family. There were never any red flags, again, besides that small dispute between Renee and Ada, which Renee thought was totally solved. We really don't know if this was done in a moment of frustration, if maybe Kyle was crying a lot and she couldn't calm him down, so she acted out of anger, or maybe she was really upset with Renee for whatever reason and purposely hurt Kyle to get back at her. Really? We have no idea what her motive was because she maintains her innocence to this day. Either way, at the end of this trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury was off for deliberations. When they came back, they found that Ada Cuadros Fernandez was in fact guilty for the capital murder of 14-month-old Kyle Lazaric. For this, she was handed a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. However, after her conviction and sentence, she appealed. Her defense stated that two errors were made in her trial. First, they said that Ada's defense was not able to cross-examine the DNA expert who testified at trial about Ada's DNA being on that tape. They also said that there was expert witness testimony rebutting the prosecution's theory, which was wrongly excluded from trial. Based on these two mistakes, Ada deserves a retrial. And six years after her conviction, it was found that these mistakes were enough to constitute a mistrial. So that same year in 2012, the prosecution held a new trial for the capital murder charges. At this trial, pretty much the same information was argued, but of course, it was done without those mistakes and the defense got a better chance to explain their side of things. By the end of the second trial, which lasted about a week, the jury was sent off for deliberations. The jury actually deliberated for almost six hours before they came back with their verdict. The jury decided that once again, Ada Cuadros Fernandez was still guilty for the capital murder of 14-month-old Kyle Lazaric. For this, she was sentenced once again to life in prison. As of right now, that is where the case sits. Ada is still sitting in prison for the violent, brutal murder of this sweet, innocent baby boy. 
To this day, she maintains her innocence. So truly, we don't know why she did this. We don't know what caused her to either snap and lash out or if she did this to get back at Renee for whatever reason. To me, in my opinion, this does seem like a situation where she lashed out and took her anger out on Kyle, but again, we really don't know why. Maybe Kyle was just being extra whiny and crying that day. Maybe he was just really hard to console that day and she was just at her wit's end and lost control and just hit that baby over and over and over again until he stopped crying. It could have been that. Or again, it could have been because she was so upset with the family at, you know, giving her shit for wanting to move or delaying her payment or whatever it was. I really don't know, but I do think that this was something that she did because she lashed out for whatever reason and took her anger out on the sweet, adorable, innocent 14 month old baby. Either way, no matter what I think, no matter what you think, no matter what anyone thinks about why this happened, I truly don't think we will ever get a solid answer because I don't think Ada is ever going to admit that she did this. Obviously, after all of this happened, Renee and Mike and the rest of the family are absolutely devastated. They never could have guessed that this woman who they trusted and loved for almost a year could turn around and harm their baby in such a violent and brutal way. It was such a shock because Ada was literally two to three weeks away from moving away and starting anew in Germany. But instead, she chose to do this, and we have no idea why. She took that trust that the family put in her and absolutely shoved it down their throats. It's absolutely devastating, so tragic. And all I can say is that I hope now, almost 20 years later, that they've been able to recover and live their lives to the best of their ability knowing that Kyle's legacy will live on with them forever. But that is where I am going to end today's video. And now after hearing the details, I'm so curious as to what you all think. Why do you think Ada did this? Do you think it was an accident or do you think she lashed out? Do you think this was a planned murder for whatever reason? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notification bells to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.